Uh, good evening. Um, welcome to um, the Corporate Committee uh, for the 2nd of February. My name is Nazia Chowdhury. I am clerk to the committee this evening. Um, the chair and the vice chair have sent apologies for this meeting and will not be attending. Can I please have nominations for chair? Can I nominate um, Councillor Ajay, please? Can I second? Councillor Ajay, uh, you are now chair for the corporate committee this evening. Colleagues, uh, thank you for nominating me to be the chair this evening, um, to stand in uh, for both the well, Councillor Diakides, who is the chair, uh, unfortunately, is absent due to. I know he's he's on the screen <laughs> for his, but uh, um, yeah, so he's not here in person. Uh, apologies, and obviously the chair as well, unfortunately, has been taken ill. So um, well, I am Councillor Charles Ajay, and I will be chairing the uh, corporate committee um, meeting this evening. And if I can ask members to. Um, uh, introduce themselves, starting from my left. Good evening, um, I'm Councillor Anna Abela, representing Haringey Ward. Hello, I'm Councillor Koshika Amin, Northumberland Park Ward. Hi, I'm Councillor Sue Jameson, Bruce Castle Ward. Hello, I'm Councillor Elridge Cowboyle, Stroud Green. Will now introduce themselves. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Minesh Jani. I'm the Head of Audit and Risk Management. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mark Stevens, Assistant Director, Direct Services. Hi, I'm Leslie Rainey. I am the Elections Project Manager. Good evening, members. My name is Tim and Paul I'm the Head of Pensions and Treasury. And I've uh, introduced myself already. I'm Nazia Chowdhury, Principal Committee Coordinator and Clerk to this committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, all. Um, the next item is apologies. Uh, although I've already mentioned that uh, we've received uh, apologies for absence from mm -hmm. Councillor Diakides. And this is Councillor Dogan, Councillor Blake, and Councillor Siemens Saffo. Uh, that is correct, Chair. Thank you. Um, can we move on to item three, urgent business? There are no items of urgent business. Thank you. Item four, declarations of interest. None? Great. From um, the top, normally uh, it is customary to, to read this, that um, uh, please note this meeting may be filmed or recorded by the Council for the live or subsequent broadcast via the Council's internet site or by anyone attending the meeting using any communication method. Members of the public, participating in the meeting, for example, making deputations, asking questions, making oral protests, should be aware that they are likely to be filmed, recorded or reported on. By entering the meeting room, you are consenting to being filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings. The chair of the meeting has the discretion to terminate or suspend filming or recording. If in his or her opinion, continuation of the filming, recording or reporting would disrupt or prejudice the proceedings, infringe the rights of any individual or may lead to the breach of a legal obligation by the council. We obviously do not have any um, members of the public present. Uh, it's a public meeting and anyone can come in at any time. So there you are. So that's been done. We've done declarations of interest. The next item is item five. I am informed that there are no deputations. And the next item 
in terms of um, the agenda is um, item six, it's the minutes. Um, There are no deputations, petitions, representations or questions, Chair. Great, thank you. So if we move to the minutes, um, which is on pages 1 to 12, um, I take it that members um, have read the minutes and um, if, can we agree the minutes? Oh, great, thank you. Um, are there any matters arising? Um, you tell me I'm not usually the chair, but if there are any outstanding issues in terms of action points that needed to be raised. 30. Thank you, Councillor Rosetti. Um, so, just by a very quick background, um, when the matter was discussed, uh, the committee felt that it was proper to make sure that there was proper governance applied to the procurement arrangements within the authority, following the presentation from, from the Head of Procurement. Um, meetings have now taken place between the Director of Finance, Head of Procurement, myself, to try to arrange uh, that governance and, and for that scrutiny of the actions which I brought to this committee in my audit papers. The plan is for this committee to receive update at its next meeting. So that's, that would be on the 28th of March and subsequent meetings depending on the outcome of those discussions and deliberations. So you should have a, you will have a paper that sets out the actions against the procurement recommendations uh, on the 28th of March and then depending on the outcome of that we can then bring in other papers but the, but the intention is that the head of procurement will uh, come to this committee and, and answer any questions or queries that they may have. Thank you. Great. So um, there being no other um, item of uh, action can we move on to item 7? Polling districts and polling places review, pages 13 to 110. Who is taking us through that? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the uh, report before you, I'll give you some uh, background context. First of all, uh, in the middle of 2021, I was asked by the former Chief Executive Zena Etheridge to lead uh, a ward boundary review project, um, which we took through uh, that year to reflect the Boundary Commission's decision to change the composition of Harringay from 19 wards to 21 wards. As a consequence of that, we identified uh, new polling places, polling stations, etc. Uh, took a report through to Corporate Committee in November of 2021 uh, in readiness for the elections in May 2022. Um, so when the elections took place, um, there was, uh, we, we sought feedback from uh, everybody concerned, in, particularly from presiding officers, uh, everyone involved, as well as the um, the polling station inspectors, of which I was one, uh, and noted there are a, a number of issues that we needed to address. Um, so as a consequence, we've carried out a further review of uh, the arrangements we put in place for the May 2022 election and identified that there were um, six wards that we needed to uh, address in terms of changing uh, some of those configurations. 
um, sometimes because a polling station might sit outside of the, the actual ward. So there are opportunities to actually make sure that the provisions for the next time we have a, an election are more appropriate. Um, we went out to consultation on those uh, in September uh, through to November of last year um, and primarily focused in on those changes. Um, we carried out consultation with the uh, councillors concerned in those wards, but also did a public consultation as well. Uh, as a consequence of that piece of work, uh, we put forward uh, some changes in the report before you tonight um, with the recommendations that are also before you uh, in section two of the report. But the six wards, I think, are, in, are all covered in paragraph 5.4, I think it is, in terms of where we made the changes. Um, and the relevant um, maps for the uh, for those changes are, are covered off in the appendices. But uh, uh, Leslie and I are more than happy to take any questions that you may have on the on the report before you. Thank you. Thank you very much for outlining that. Um, Councillor Amin. I can't comment on the other on the wards you're looking at specifically, but I know for Northumberland Park it was a bit of a nightmare for all those people who went off to the Eric Allen Centre where we used to have a polling station, and there was no signage there but a poster saying phone this number. Well, if you rang that number, you'd be on a loop actually because you wouldn't go anywhere. Nobody was telling you where to go, so it was a I thought was really badly organised, and it meant we would probably have lost voters who gave up. By going to the Eric Allen Centre, which you know they historically for 10, 15 years have been doing so, and uh, didn't go any further to look for the NRC. So I thought that was a bit of a debacle, and I wonder if that happened in other places as well. I mean, for me, I was so disappointed that there wasn't a kind of proper clear uh, information for people. There wasn't anywhere to say, you know, your polling station has been moved to. Uh, the uh, NRC in our case, it just said ring this number, <laughs> which is just absolutely ridiculous. So I just wondered, I mean, if you're making changes, one of the things about people is they're used to the polling station they go to. They've gone to them for years and years and years. So they'll toddle off to that polling station. And if there isn't any good signage to explain and how to walk there and everything else, it just means you lose them. And that's what we were doing on the day because I, I and we were there for an event and it was just really bad. It was just dreadful, actually. So I just um, am mindful that it's nice to organise them and do all of this. But unless you can explain that to people on the ground, it's a bit of a waste of time. Happy to respond to that, Chair. Initially, uh, Leslie might add some more. But in, in terms of the, the approach that we took, um, obviously there was a substantial change moving from 19 wards to 21 wards, and some of the polling places that we'd had to use beforehand were no longer appropriate for the the, the, the revised wards. So we, it, there was a degree of inevitability that some people would end up going to the wrong location. Um, and that was exacerbated, as I said, by having some polling um, polling stations outside of the zone that people were, were, were supposed to be voting for. Um, but what we did do in advance, we did do an awful lot of communication. Uh, what I did forget to say was that there was an all member, uh, all party um, member working group uh, set up for the original review process that we, we led through. Um, I think membership of that was about 12 councillors altogether, just to make sure that we actually went through the formal process of making sure that we'd actually gone through the right steps. Um, we had a particular com uh, communications plan pulled together, which that, that working group actually uh, fully endorsed. Um, so we got an awful lot of messaging out there. The one change that in particular I would flag up is that on every single uh, polling card that we went out to each elector had clear instructions as to where the polling station was for them to go to. Um, but it was inevitable that, uh, and I saw it on the day myself as a polling station inspector going around and seeing people saying, uh, I've, I've come here to vote and been advised by the presiding officer or the poll clerk, I'm sorry, you've come to the wrong station. Um, they had the poll card in their hand and said, can you flip it over? They looked at it and suddenly realised they were in the wrong location. We did as good a job as we could actually getting people to the right location. And part of what we've done here is, you know, where I'm particularly conscious of some of those changes that need to be made, we have tried to do that in here as well. Uh, also, part of the change was actually losing some of the um, uh, the, the temporary buildings that we used beforehand, the, the pool to cabin type of approach, because uh, they, they just not really conducive. We were looking for, as part of the overall change to the 21 wards, making sure we got more suitable buildings for people to go to. Um, 
and again, when it comes to the next election, we will be doing an awful lot of communications to try to make sure that everyone's aware of the uh, the requirements and where they need to go to. Uh, but we do recognise that there were always going to be people that went to the wrong place. But it's very difficult given the, the, the extent of the change that we're experiencing for that May 2022 election. I mean, all I'm asking for is a poster to be put up on a polling station or where old ones are to say this is where your new polling station is because, and it's very straightforward, so I'm not asking for the earth as it were, but I just think, and people don't look at the card, I don't look at my card, I just assume I'm going to where I always go, <laughs> I've gone for years and I just, I don't bother, I just pick up my card, sometimes I don't go with my card, it is all of those things, so you kind of, have to remember that people function habitually, don't they? They've, that's that's life. So, um, you know, I thought it, um, Leslie's here and I think it's, you know, you tried your level best. I agree. The challenge was phenomenal. And I think I agreed to the shift from Eric Allen to the NRC. So I kind of, I understand it all. And I do know you've tried, absolutely. But I know on the day, I remember thinking, oh, come on now. And then we put up posters at the Eric Allen Centre, but people just don't get it. I mean, that's the thing. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, if I can just come in on that, because I mean, as you say, people are creatures of habit. And so no matter how much you tell them, they're still going to follow. Because we also, when we sent out the housing notification letter, the household notification letter in February, we started flagging it then. Um, and as, as Mark says, we did lots of other comps, not just using digital channels. We used all sorts of different channels. The problem with putting on your polling station has changed to X is that not everyone's polling station who's changed in that ward will have changed to the same polling station. So, for example, in some of the wards, some of the streets might have gone to that district and some might have gone to the next one over. So that's where you cannot, on a poster, put a specific location because it might not be true for everyone. That poster should have included, because we did put posters up at places we were no longer using. Um, I think the one place we missed was where the portable used to be in the middle of um, West Green Ward, but we, there should have been posters up at every polling station we were no longer using that referenced the Democracy Club's polling station finder. So it, it shouldn't have just been a phone number because they take our data and they give you, basically you put in your postcode and they will tell you where your polling station is. So it wasn't just a phone number. We did our best to use digital channels. So it's really difficult, as I say, to, you can't put a specific location on as an alternative. Um, we, all we can do is help people. The other thing that we could do is, well, actually not in that case because it, 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 the polling station is gone, but obviously people outside, we had marshals at polling stations who had the polling station list. So if somebody came to the wrong polling station, they could help signpost them to the correct one. We did all we could. It was inevitable that there were going to be sort of issues across the whole, the whole piece. Um, because of the way turnout is at a local election and how it's different at a general election, there will still be a number of people who come to future elections who will be going to their new polling stations the first time. So this problem and getting people to the right place isn't necessarily going to go away sort of this time around. So it's just working as we can to keep getting that message out, but we'll keep trying. It's our ambition to try to not to disenfranchise as many people Absolutely. as possible. That's Absolutely. obviously where we're coming from. And that's why we did an extensive comms uh, approach in terms yeah. of getting those messages out. Uh, not disenfranchising people, because I know that there was some discussion, wasn't there, nationally about the kind of information people will need to go and vote. Again, that's for me, for Northern Park. I mean, then. It's just people just do it as it were. They don't, you know, they don't worry about, they don't have their phone with them even. There's all that stuff which they just don't do. So I just worry a little bit about not losing again pe people's ability. So if there is information about that, that will be helpful to pass along to us, please. Um, well, obviously, the, what people need to take with them to vote is going to change in the future with bringing in voter ID. So that is... I mean, for the next election that we have, we've no scheduled elections this year. Obviously, we have the by-election that, 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 that's been sort of launched, the process being published today. Um, but they, for the next election that happens after May or after October, if it's a general, you will need to bring voter ID. So that's going to be another lot of messaging that is going to be really complicated to get out. Um, we're changing the fact, well, not we, but the government are changing the franchise about who can vote from EU nationals and so on. So there's going to be a lot of very complicated messaging that we're going to give out. We are planning to do an all member briefing so that we can engage you in sharing, in cascading that information, because 
you're the ones that have direct contact with with people and and we've got a comms uh, meeting set up that will look at different ways we can use um different channels to engage with people so going into the community and using existing groups to make sure that we're, we're doing that so we're, we're we're looking at new approaches to how we engage in, in elections messaging generally anyway so but it's it's very hard i mean even i was saying to, to mark the other day that that my mum's polling station had changed and even though i'd been working on this for months i was really confused about my mum's polling station having changed so <laughs> it happens to us all so you know it it's it, it i completely get it but if it changes and and people We'll just have to work it out. So, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Rosetti. Thanks. I also want to uh, reiterate we had similar experiences in Alexandra, and I think we lost uh, several voters along the way because uh, uh, St Andrew's Church, the usual place where uh, Alexandra residents would go to vote, was now Fortis Green. And there were no signs, there was no warden. The tellers had to help residents to say, no, actually, you know, you shouldn't be voting here. And uh, I think we shouldn't be relying too much on polling cards because I don't think they are uh, necessary to go to vote. So a lot of people that just don't bring with them, they just don't look at them, they just go to the usual polling station. And when they get there, maybe they're late to go to work. I mean, they, they don't just go looking for the new station. It's possible, I don't know, it's, I think it might change for future elections, but if it doesn't, perhaps it would be good not to rely too much on uh, polling cards. Thanks. Just, just to come back on that, Chair, it was one of the many methods we try to use to actually get the message out there, but it, it, it's difficult because, as Councillor Amina said, you know, we're all creatures of habit. Um, and as much as we get, try to get the information out there, not everyone picks up on it. But you know, again, we're, we're working really hard with the next time around to actually make sure we get that clear message out there that everyone can pick up as best as we possibly can. That's all my mom. Thank you. Um, just touching on the, the point about um, going to residents about voter ID, I think a recommendation would be to go to add a question to that and ask them how they feel about their polling stations. If it's too far away, if it's too close, I think generally across the board, it would be good to have that information to hand. Um, my question relates to page 27 and kind of the the boundaries. So it's less to do with uh, the polling stations in question, but to do with polling stations in general. How are the boundaries created? Because um, I mean, if you look at someone that lives in White Hart Lane B, if you look at if you live round the north of it, you're closer to the polling station in White Hart Lane A, but on the card it will tell you to go to the polling station in White Hart Lane B. So is there something to look at? Yeah, what's closest and what's easiest? Yeah. So um, Mark's sitting chuckling beside me because he knows that I have spent months looking at the maps for this and yeah. the software that we use for this is, is a touch glitchy and temperamental, which makes me a touch glitchy and temperamental too. Um, so yeah, what we do is we look at the existing, I mean, we, when we did the fundamental review last time round, we had to do the whole borough and we looked at all the districts within all the wards. So the wards are set by the Boundary Commission for England um local government boundary commission they set the wards and then we look at how you distribute the population around it some of that is guided by where there's a suitable building some of that's guided by the size of the population and also the size of suitable building so for example if a building is really small or if there's a school but they can give us a room without closing the school but it's a small room, so we have to make that a single, so we have to limit the population. We looked at look, uh, allocating around 2,500 electors per polling station, so that means in a double polling station that's up to 5,000. So it was looking at all those things and literally it was moving lines on maps and replotting and moving them around to try and get the population as balanced as, as possible. And again, you know, taking this down to a really personal level, my nearest polling station is literally across the road from my flat. It's not my polling station. So it it, it has to happen that way in that there's always going to be a boundary. So I, I live right on the boundary between West Green and St Anne. So that's why that is. So there's always going to be a boundary and somebody who's nearest nearing a polling station. We looked at criteria last time round around the walking distance. We tried to make it about a 10 minute walk, um, 10, 15 minute walk. We set as the, the limit 
where that was possible. Um, and some of the tweaks that we've made um, are around sort of shortening some of those distances where we can. But it just depends on what property is available that we can use as polling places without causing too much disruption. Um, we did do a massive consultation um, last time round and it was sort of lighter touch this time round, but we have it was a public consultation, so it was communicated and we do get feedback after elections from people. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we do engage with, with the public about what they want. You know, that's really good to hear. Um, I think uh, what concerns me is uh, with the low turnout, there's probably a lower chance of the overcrowding um, or having uh, yeah, too many people go to one uh, centre. So it might be possible for, especially the wards where you, we've seen lower turnouts and especially with new voter ID, which we expect would probably bring down um, voter turnout even more to look at distance um, more than looking at overcrowding. Um, just, just to, yeah, just to make it, yeah, just to make it a bit more, um, just to try to get more voters really um, and make it easier for them. So I think increasing, the, so the, the Electoral Commission guidance on the numbers is the 2,500 figure I quoted. We were aiming between two and 3,000. What we've done this time around is we have reduced um, the target figure because what will happen with voter ID is that the amount of time to process each elector in the polling station will increase because they will have an extra process to go through. So although they might not get the turnout and we might not get the numbers, actually the amount of time. So we have to look at numbers in terms of that as well. Um, and we can't really increase numbers to kind of try and, 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 and make it all fit. So we had to look at it. It is just a juggling act and a, a jigsaw in terms of getting people to the right place and to the right. But the main thing is getting that message out about your polling station has changed, which we, you know, we tried to message about, but also telling people where the polling station is and how to get information about how to find it in digital and hard copy methods as well. So. Thank you. Um, my question is slightly outside the, the scope of, of this report, but I, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned that there will be changes to the eligibility of certain EU citizens, and I think this will impact a significant proportion um, of residents here in Haringey. Could you briefly explain what the changes are and if we have an estimate of how many people will be impacted by this in our borough? I wouldn't like to estimate we haven't started doing that piece of work because one of the things we don't necessarily hold on the electoral register is exactly, you know, is one of the pieces of work we, we have to do. So the rules aren't coming in quite yet and we don't, we have got time basically to do that research and that analysis um, because the rules are coming in. I can't remember the exact date, but they're not in for any of our next elections in the next year. So we've got time and the deadlines that the government have put in place give us time to do that preparation work. And obviously, as I say, we're doing a whole piece of comms work around all the different requirements of the Elections Act because there's also requirements around accessibility. And that's not just about polling stations being physically accessible, but it's about making sure people know that they're physically accessible. So there's a whole load of information. Also, the sort of the, the rules are changing around um, the sort of overseas voters and so on. So there will be a whole piece of work that will be done separately around that. So I, I, I don't want to come to with you to any sort of figures that I would just be making up, but we will be coming and doing an all member briefing on all the implications of the Elections Act and we'll make sure that you get all the information about which EU residents are, are implicated because it's not just a case of people from the EU can't vote anymore. It's people who were settled here before a certain time can vote certain people who've settled after from certain countries. It's 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 really difficult to articulate clearly. So that's why I'd rather we gave it to you as a solid piece of information that we will bring it to members at, at, a, at a later point. And we, we made sure that we didn't actually put any of that into this report to actually make you even more confused than you needed yeah. to be today. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, 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 I mentioned it too early. Thank you very much. Interesting. I live in Stroud Green, which encompasses uh, Muswell Hill and uh, Highgate, which is all very hilly. How do you analyze issues of that nature, especially for the elderly people? It was really challenging looking at that and, and not necessarily particularly Stroud Green, but looking at Muswell Hill because one of the targets we were trying to do was to minimise the number of temporary buildings because they're not ideal for voting. And although 
actually in this paper we are proposing uh, a new portable because that is what that space needs. So in the bottom part of Muswell Hill, there's a portable that's right in the middle of a really, really hilly area. And we looked long and hard to see if we could find an alternative because actually we, we, we drove past where we put the, the, the portable and we couldn't work out how the driver gets the portable, portable building in there. So we did think about sort of terrain and, and hilly. We, we went physically out and we visited all the polling stations across a team of about three or four of us. So we did take into account and that was where we tried to sort of minimise the walking distance as much as possible because obviously 10 minutes uphill is, is harder going than 10 minutes on the flat for anyone. So so yeah, we did try and think about that. Um, and as I say, in Muswell Hill, the solution was to leave the portable, even though we were trying to minimise them. So we did try, but it all depends on where the, the dangerous suitable buildings are as well. So that, that is a, a limiting factor as well. So. Great, thank you very much. OK, did you? OK, come. Councillor James. So in the last elections, in the council elections, um, what percentage of people had to change their um, polling station, do you reckon? Okay. Can I ask any other or further questions? No? <laughs> so, um, did, <laughs> well, well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I think most of the points I was going to make, uh, make uh, have been, you know, made or questions asked um, in terms of access and stuff, and that uh, in terms of also um, uh, signage because that's definitely a problem um, in my ward. Um, so you, you seem to have more or less captured and taken everything into account. So hopefully um, you'll be very well prepared for the future. So, yeah. um, so one of the things that as a polling station inspector, I was very conscious of as I was walking around was there are certain locations where it's very difficult to put up the necessary signage to steer people towards polling station. If you're in church hall or whatever, you have railings outside and if it was raining, you can actually imagine all the signs just disappear. So one of the, another thing we have actually talked about is actually making the, the signage that's actually used at each polling station resilient to the weather yeah. because we can't tell what time of year it's going to take place. Yeah. yeah. So you're okay. building up on that, making sure that we've got ro more robust uh, approach to signage is one of the things that we have been looking at. Yeah. We're, we're very mindful of that. Because uh, as I turn up at the polling station, I see all this papers just being blown down the road where it had been tied onto the onto yeah. the railings. It just wasn't staying. So, yeah, yeah it, it was an issue on the day, and it's something yeah. that we are looking to work around. I mean, we did invest in a whole set of new vinyl signs for every polling station. Every polling station had two of the large vinyl signs, which are much more weather robust. Um, but whether you know, making sure that the polling station staff put up the right sign as well is another thing. And also we invested in um, a lot of pavement signs, which are much more, more sort of sturdy and robust. But one of the things is some polling stations just need one of those, others need three or four. So it's just, just tweaking that so we make sure we get that distribution right. But, but I mean, I got rid of a whole load of wooden signs that we'd had for many, many years and, you know, splinters are, are plenty. So we've cleared out all that and we've got all new signage. So you know, we'll keep improving and keep and, you know, I love getting feedback at the end of the election because actually it does make us a challenge just to improve. So do feed us back feedback to us. After and anyway. going for things like vinyl signs, laminated signs means you can reuse them as well. Whereas a lot of the paper last time it, it just got recycled. So we, we don't really want to go down that route if we can. If we can actually go through that reuse approach, yeah. that's where we're looking to come from. Good. Thank you very much. Can we agree the recommendations are set out on uh, paragraph two? Thank you. If we can, thank you, officers, for that. If we can now move on to um, the hot topic of which we have had um, a wonderful training, uh, which is um, item eight, Treasury Management, pages 111 to 138. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. My name is Tim Mpofu. I'm the head of pensions and treasury um, here at Haringey. And yeah, as the chair mentioned, we did have a training uh, before the session on treasury management and some of the um, 
the the work that 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 the council has to undertake in order to fulfill its obligations. So the paper that I'm introducing to you this evening is the Treasury Management Strategy Statement. It is a requirement for the council to approve a Treasury um, Strategy Management Statement, and essentially this document looks at how the council looks at its cash flows, its investments, its borrowing, and how it makes those decisions. So essentially, it outlines a framework that, as a council, um, we are required to undertake uh, to make sure that the 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 um the, this, the borrowing decisions and these capital market transitions are done in a, in in, a, in an effective way. Um. So essentially, this document will be going through that in a great deal a bit of detail. There's various sections which I'll go through shortly that sort of outline the different strategies that the council can adopt. Um. But just maybe before we go through to the report, just to remind members around the process at Haringate. So essentially the Treasury Management Strategy is drafted alongside the budget process. The budget process looks at the capital program, how that's developed, and the Treasury Manager, uh, Management Strategy looks at how that can be funded. So once it's been formulated alongside that work, it also goes to the scrutiny committee alongside the budget. So this particular uh, document went to the scrutiny on the 19th of January. And um, there were some comments on there, but it was mainly asking for clarification. So there's nothing for the committee to note or anything that we can advise the committee any differently. But just to notify you that it has gone through that scrutiny process. Once that scrutiny process is completed, it then comes to this committee, the COPPA committee. This is as per Haringey's constitution. It is the committee that's responsible for uh, making sure or having oversight that the Treasury decisions are being undertaken in a way that's consistent with the strategy. Um, so this is why we're here at this meeting. And essentially what the corporate committee do is you make a recommendation for the full council to adopt this as a strategy document, which goes alongside the council budget, which I think there's a meeting in March of full council where that will be decided. So essentially what we're asking members is um, uh, you recommend that this be adopted and that it be accepted as the uh, strategy strategy for the council for 2023 and 2024. So just going into a bit of the report, the report itself, um, covers quite a wide range of sections, but then the first thing just to highlight to members is around the economic environment that we find ourselves in. So over the last few year, or over the last year or 18 months, we've seen that inflation has started to increase. As a result, central banks have increased their interest rates, and today we saw another interest rate from the Bank of England in a way to try and combat that inflation. That essentially means that the council's uh, cost of borrowing over the next few years is likely to well, is going to be higher than it's been in the past. So just to emphasize again for members benefit that the council doesn't have any variable rate loans. So the impact on that will be on any new decisions or any new uh, borrowing decisions that will be made going forward. So to account for that, we have assumed that any borrowing that was going to be made by the um, council going forward will be at an interest rate of 4.5%. This is based on an advice and analysis that we received from our treasury advisor, Alan Close. They do the modeling work and they look at the market movements, how people are pricing different uh, derivatives and swap options and determine where they think the path of interest rates will be. And as such, we've included a 4.5%. This has also been shared across the teams when they've been uh, appraising any capital programs. So this is a consistent figure that across the council, everyone has been applying. But the upside of higher interest rates is we can get more money or more uh, interest on our deposits. So as such, we've seen with the balances that we've been holding and the interest rates going up that the cash, uh, the, the, the council has actually been able to generate a lot more investment related income. Um, so to account for that as well, we've assumed that any future deposits we'll make will be done at a rate of 3.5%. So that's a meaningful increase from previous years where it was probably around 50 basis points, which is not 0.05% because rates at that time were really low. So this is just showing that even though there are pressures in terms of how we'll be making borrowing decisions, there may also be opportunities in terms of how the council manages its investment uh, decisions and that's been laid out in this report in detail. Um, so before I maybe in invite members or take back to you chair for any member questions that members might have is just to just give an overview of what the report is. Um, in section four there is the borrowing strategy that essentially outlines the purpose of or, or, or the approach that the council will take in making any borrowing decision. And the key here for the council is to make sure that we are able to secure low interest costs, but we're also able to achieve cost certainty. So that means essentially we, once we make a borrow, uh, once we take out a debt instrument, we know what the interest payments we have to pay for that. That's fully accounted for. Delaying that decision 
has an advantage that you're not borrowing a higher rate, but it also means that in the future you might have to borrow at even higher rates. So that is the approach that this document sets out that as officers, we undertake that by bearing those two principles in mind, um, cost certainty um, and low costs. The second bit is on the investment strategy, which I just outlined. And again, this uh, report kind of sets out the recommendation of the SIP for code, which is the accountancy code that the council is signed up to. And essentially it looks at the security requirements, which is basically, is our money placed in a safe place? It looks at the liquidity, can we get it when we need to get it? And then it looks at how we can invest it. Um, the council has been investing with debt management uh, office, which is a government agency that offers rates that are similarly priced to the Bank of England rates. And essentially that is considered to be the safest place where you can deposit the money and we can deposit the money overnight or for longer term periods up to six months. And again, that is set out in that area in terms of what other instruments we can use to be able to make those investment decisions. Section five of the report, oh, sorry, I think I said about that one. So the section seven of the report now looks at um, once that those strategy has been agreed, what are the prudential indicators or what are the measures that you as, 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 as members can make sure that officers are complying by the requirements of the strategy? So essentially there we're looking at how we manage and measure our risk and there's some parameters that have been set and every quarter we come to this committee to provide an update that compares around those, uh, uh, th th those indicators. So that's again for members to note if there are any comments or questions around how those have been set or if they're happy with them because essentially they set the limits for us as officers to, uh, to undertake this work. Um, so I think this is probably as much as I can do in the opening remarks, but I'm happy to take any questions from members on the detail of the appendix to this report, Chair. Thank you, Officer. Uh, questions, Councillor Seti? Thanks. Um, just to follow up really from what we said, we said previously, because um, what I really would like to focus is on table one and the level of, uh, of borrowing, uh, which is quite, uh, which is quite high. So I would feel much more confident in uh, recommending uh, uh, this report if I could see uh, exactly in which section is explained how we are going to uh, repay this level of borrowing. Uh, where it is explained how the risk is managed, because it's true that we do have a series of um, um, try this. Uh, criteria uh, on uh, on the, the ones that you were mentioning, uh, um, indicators, prudential indicators, but those are indicators. So to me. Uh, it doesn't really spell out how the risk is management. So I wonder if you could uh, point out well in the report those two those two things are. So how the risk is management and how we're going to repay this level of borrowing. Thanks. All right. Thank thank you. Um, thank you for your question. So maybe just to start with the first bit around um, how this sort of comes about. So this document is set by statute requirements as to what you should include in a treasury strategy statement. It is usually included as part of the budget process as well, where there's another document which is called the capital uh, strategy document that sets out how schemes uh, uh, um, uh, are, uh, are basically appraised and looks at the process of how the, the business case are tested. So when this goes to budget, it will go alongside those requirements. However, those strategy decisions or the capital program decisions are not made in the context of this treasury strategy. Essentially, what this treasury strategy looks at is what has been the agreed uh, capital program uh, that's been agreed by the council. And the capital program involves a number of different factors, such as uh, building houses around the borough, uh, such as rebuilding schools or refurbishments. They all comprise the capital program. They're then appraised by the rate that I mentioned earlier, and then they are costed out in, in this strategy, in the capital strategy document. This document in particular looks at how the element of borrowing is actually exercised by, by, by the council, because in order to fulfill some of those obligations, there will have to be an element where we have to borrow. So essentially that report, what you're seeing here are the reflections of what the capital strategy has been agreed. And there is no anywhere in here um, that talks around how they've actually been appraised. And that's not something that I would be involved in managing um, in my role sort of a, a, in treasury management. So I don't know if that answers the first part of your question before I go to the second part of the question. Yeah, well, it's a sort of follow up because then if uh, 
how we are going to manage this level of borrowing is not supposed to go into this report. Where would we find that information? So that information will be provided to you. And I, I think members might have already seen this because I understand that the budget has been approved or it's been agreed um, or, or it is being agreed at the cabinet level and would then go to full agreement. So that budget that's been agreed at the cabinet level would have fed into this work. So I am provided with those numbers that's been agreed. And my role is to decide how best they can be funded within this framework. Chair, yeah, through you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, um, if you could just maybe indicate. Chair, uh, okay, can you introduce yourself, please? Sorry, thank you, Chair. My name is Benita Edwards. I'm um, Head of Legal Services. I just wanted to note that the um, draft budget and medium term financial strategy are going to Cabinet next week. So they haven't gone, they have not been approved at this stage. <clears throat> thank you. So that would be the document, the the um, medium term financial strategy. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Go on. So the second question was on how the risks are managed. So essentially, what the prudential indicators do, which are on section. So I'm just going to find it on my notes. Uh, Yes, so in section seven of this report where we set out those indicators, these are actually limits in how those decisions are made. So for example, when we're looking at investing with a counterparty, mm -hmm. you want someone that provides you a great degree of security. So they you 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 feel they're gonna stay in business, they're not gonna not pay you back. And essentially there is a target there, which is the, the rating of an institution that would invest in. So we wouldn't go beyond investing in that because essentially if there wasn't a target, then you could place money with anyone who's offering you a good rate. So this puts a limit in terms of how you're managing an investment risk. When you look at liquidity, it's around making sure that we have cash available to be able to make payments. Again, there's a limit of around 20 million. That's based on where we see the budget movements. Um, sometimes that balance tends to be higher. Um, but essentially, we know that if we have 20 million, we'll be able to meet all our short term commitments. Um, and then the interest rate exposures again is on the, uh, the variable rates, which the council doesn't hold any of those rates. But of course, on the short term end, those can have an, an effect in terms of uh, if rates continue to increase, that's going to become more expensive. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the actual borrowing itself, the idea when I go back to that principle of making sure that we've got cost certainty over a period of time, but also flexibility. One of the key things that happens is we've got um, uh, loans within our portfolio that are maturing on a regular basis. Uh, basically, they're, they're becoming due to be repaid. So what you're trying to do is spread out when you have to repay those loans. And this um, table in uh, section 7.6 essentially spreads out when the maturity profile of those uh, of those particular loans will be. So for example, there will be loans that if we're taking out a loan tomorrow, we might do it for over 10 years. You don't want all your borrowing to be over 10 years because in 10 years time, you're going to be having to pay back a significant amount of money. So that table looks at breaking it down in terms of this is how we're going to make those decisions. And when we present it to you in in, in terms of um, on a, on, on, on the quarterly basis, that's one of the figures where you might see there will be significant movements and that will be based on the decisions that have been made. But as officers we won't be going uh, the breach that set out in these limits. Um, and then the last one is really on short term borrowing. Again, it's limiting how much we can have with short term lenders, which are usually at the local authorities. And that limit is at 30%. It again gives us that flexibility of delaying some of those longer term decisions. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to uh, push those decisions too far into the future in case costs become um, too high. So I think that that's essentially how I can explain that framework. And going forward, that's how I would be sort of explaining those and showing how we've um, kept within those limits that have been set. So basically, every investment that the council made has to meet those uh, criteria. That's the sort of short. Yes, he has to be within okay. those constraints. Yes. Thanks. Councillor <coughs> Amin. Unfortunately, one of the council over there has raised quite a few uh, um, questions that I would have also asked um, and did ask earlier. So that's really good. Um, I guess I think the only thing I had an issue with, um, in, in addition to the issues raised earlier, um, was about having something here about the 
policy to reduce payment and um, and borrowing rather, because I felt that the borrowing is very, very high. And what I didn't have was any reassurance that there is a policy um, to reduce borrowing and how we do it. So there wasn't a, there, there wasn't that approach. And I can see why the document doesn't do that. But if you're looking at it without looking at the way borrowing is managed and how as a council we're working towards reducing borrowing, then it doesn't really give me any confidence, really, to be absolutely honest. Um, you know, it just feels as if there's a gap in that information. That's my current thinking anyway. Thank you. So I suppose with this document, um, again, going to the point of the capital program is the primary influencer of how that debt over time will evolve. So if the council wasn't spending on capital programs over time, you'd see that debt come down because we would not be taking out any new debt. But as long as the council continues to have to meet those, you know, those very important um, projects that have to be undertaken, whether it's, like I said before, with schools or with housing, what happens in effect is that debt is going to continue to increase because we are still adding more projects and they need to be financed in some way. In each individual scheme that is appraised, they will look at um, other elements which might not be in this program, because again, that's not something I'd be responsible with, but we'll be looking at where the revenues, the future revenues are gonna come from, that again, you can find that in the MTFS or in the um, in, in the budget papers. So each scheme before it's even appraised and before members would have been tested. And this just looks at if, if we keep on having an accumulation of those, um, uh, of those schemes, and if they are important for us to live on, this is how we're going to have to finance them. And then for us, the challenge, or for me, the challenge is how can we do that without uh, doing, uh, without having too much cost uh, for for the authority. And this framework sets the framework for me to pro probably uh, action those decisions. Could make a reference to the strategies to support. The reduction. I'm, I'm not. I'm. I'm not saying we can't borrow. We should borrow, obviously. But um, I guess for me, it's a massive, massive increase. I mean, if I look at the figures and just think, I don't think in all the years I've been a councillor, I remember seeing these kind of figures, and I can understand why. And then the bit, the other bit of me says, how are we managing that um, to ensure that we're not borrowing any more than we have to? Are we being efficient about the resources we're using and how are we being efficient? It just seems to me, and the interest rates are so high that every penny counts now. I don't want to be a Tesco advert, but do you know what I mean? It's just, it feels that's the bit, that gap yeah. is what I feel um, is not clear there because and it feels like you're saying yeah well yeah we'll borrow it we'll be all right about it and if we don't borrow now we we'll have to borrow in the future but that doesn't help me feel that we are actually using whatever borrowing we're doing efficiently and effectively and I just worry a little bit about it that's all I presume you don't have anything further to add to that um <laughs> no yeah okay great um Councillor Jamieson I mean I think um the levels of borrowing are concerning, but um, the government now has borrowed trillions, haven't they? Um, and I just want to know, <laughs> what's the worst possible scenario? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I don't, I don't know what would be. I, I I I don't I don't think there needs to be. Uh, I, I understand where members are coming from in terms of having been the cabinet member for finance. That's some previous uh, previous incarnation, as it were. Those are the things that officers and members will discuss in terms of the risks, you know, involved in that. Uh, in terms of the level of borrowing, um, the level of borrowing currently, obviously, is based on the on the council's uh, project in terms of house building. Um, we haven't got that money to build just, you know, like that. Casey, who deals with all that aspect, actually goes through the whole stuff. I think there's been a presentation here in terms of the MTFS on that aspect of the housing pro project. I think it's a bit difficult for um, the Treasury management document to, I, I know what you're suggesting is that that should be mentioned in terms of the level of borrowing to say well, if from a prudential point of view. But then when you go to the, the um, uh, page, uh, what's it called? Treasury management prudential indicators. That's looked at as well in terms of level of borrowing. Um, but each each project got to be evaluated and uh, analyzed. to so say how do we go about you know, funding this? 
you know, so the, the risks is looked at and the, the section 151 officer, uh, the, he, that's his job and the deputy. So um, I think the point is well made and I think it's something that, you know, needs to be, well, taken back to the uh, uh, section 151 officer, but ultimately it's the, the decision is... <laughs> Councillor Dakilis, can you mute, please? Um, if you, <laughs> thank you. Um, se section one five one officer, uh, 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 in, obviously in consultation with uh, with the cabinet relevant cabinet member at the time. When this is explained in the meeting, that is fine. But for us, it's difficult to, you know, to be called to uh, recommend a report or a treasury strategy. Because in the end, it looks like we are told uh, this has all been worked out in the background. Officers have gone through it, so just, you know, but we don't know what has been worked out in the background. It's sort of like we should blindly trust it without having the piece of information. So at least uh, having in the report, uh, you know, this, this, is, uh, this is how this is happening in the background. So this is the result of, I don't know, of... Uh, the decision and the analysis made by this officer, this officer, or this team, and this other team, that at, at least we, we, you know, uh, because otherwise it's very difficult to, to appreciate even the work that has gone, you know, behind. Sorry, sorry Councillor Romain, if you could turn him on. I was just going to say, it's isn't just that and it's a good point that you make for me it's about my responsibility and i can't just say okay it looks nice and you said yes and i go okay then i um that's not how i'm built i'm afraid i'm i know for me i need information um and it's not that i'm seeking reassurance from you either i understand what you're saying but it just feels like there's a gap in it in the in the text and i think referencing the other bits would make me feel a little bit more reassured that there is proper management of the the borrowing that we are undertaking at the moment, especially at this current climate, um, when everybody else is facing enormous hardship and we're saying don't buy and uh, don't borrow and, you know, the interest rates are so high as well. I mean, I, I was looking at the figures thinking, gosh, the interest rates that the government said the interest rates, said, said the not the government, it was the Bank of England at four percent which is incredible um and the people's mortgages are going to go up through the roof now you know so i think i'm just asking questions which i think are appropriate for a corporate committee because if i don't ask then i'm just agreeing to everything blindly which is the last thing i am i'm afraid uh, mem members are on the right track in terms of asking those questions you are right it is your duty uh, to ask those questions so I think what you cannot have, though, is is those salient points that you're talking about in it in in a in this tre um, treasury strategy document, because this sets out the overall framework uh, in line with CIFA uh, requirements. That's what it is. In terms of the nitty gritty you're talking about, perhaps maybe in a covering report, yeah, that will that yeah, but not in the treasury uh, treasury strategy document itself. You, yeah, it's never done. So in a covering communication, like the, the, the report written by the officers, just to reassure you, will tell you that these are the things that, or how officers go about it. It's very tedious, but at least to provide you guys with reassurance that it's been done, that's what you're asking for, yeah. you know, uh, uh, and that I, hopefully you're taking that away. And when the report is written in the future, um, just, you know, in terms of the introduction or something like that, then that, that aspect can cover it. And I think also maybe um, for, 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 for the future um, is that we talked about the training because it was a bit rushed. So not necessarily, and I can understand why it's been done the way it's been done to say, let's have the training first and then the, the committee, you take the paper. So it's fresh in members' memory. But I think if it's done maybe a, a day or two in advance with members making notes on the report, uh, that will help member, members and keep members well informed when it comes to the meeting. It's a suggestion. Councillor Amin. Is, is this the report going as a corporate committee report or is it a report of the cabinet? Treasury management is a, uh, is a requirement of this committee to approve okay. it and because it brings in the various aspects of, you know, the council's borrowing and other stuff together. That's why it's called treasury management uh, or strategy rather. Yeah. 
just then ask, Chair, that I think your suggestion was helpful, that if some of that text was added in the front um, and the cover note on, on the report, that would make me feel a little bit more reassured. It just seems to me we're asking sensible things. If you're going to be an active member of a committee where you've got to look at the money that the council has, then you've got to ask those questions. Otherwise, what's the point, eh? You'll miss me when I'm not on the committee. No. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, I know um, the new members on the co on the committee. It's not. It's it's this. This is this is nothing new. It's something that the treasury management and uh, strategy is always agreed. Um, used to be uh, what's it called? Um, is it forgotten the name of the committee anyway? That used to deal with it on. But when the corporate uh, um, well, it was uh, two committees merged to form the corporate committee. So it. it Oh, yeah, so so that responsibility falls within this. So we, without without much ado, I think um, the points that you've made have been well made and noted. Um, can we agree the recommendations are set out in the report? Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, if we can now move on to um, item nine, which is the um, twenty. Stroke 21 audit progress report pages 139 to 180 and uh, I presume that that would be Dinesh. No, who is moving that? On the screen? All right, great. Over to you. Start by introducing yourself, please. Um, good evening. Um, my name's uh, David Eagles. I'm the external audit partner from BDO, and I'm the, the key audit partner and engagement lead for uh, the Harringay audit. Um, I've got with me uh, two colleagues, um, Tashia Vosper, who's the uh, audit senior manager for the audit, and Anmol Apol, who is the uh, assistant manager. Um, so we have a, um, a progress report on the agenda for this evening. Uh, so it's not a complete final completion report. There are a number of issues which we're still uh, uh, dealing with, uh, partly to do with um, just sort of tidy up and completion uh, and finishing quality review, but also some issues on um, valuations, which we're working through and have been discussing things uh, and, and solutions with uh, officers and also valuers. Uh, there's also um, the infrastructure matter, which we've talked about to the corporate committee in previous meetings, which is coming to a conclusion. Uh, and various parts of the um, the puzzle are in place now in terms of guidance from SIPFA, uh, changes to the code, which the authority has to comply with, and also a statutory instrument from government. Um, so this final bit of work through, which we've been talking about in terms of some sensitivity analysis, but that finally is coming to conclusion. So uh, the reason for having uh, a progress report at this stage is because we haven't been reporting uh, any of the sort of detailed findings to date, and I think it will be helpful for members to see one that there has been significant progress and a lot of uh, issues worked through and concluded, but also it gives you or has given you, hopefully if you had a chance to read it, uh, a flavour for the sort of things that we are still uh, working with to finalise. Um, we are uh, working to get this sort of completed uh, before our NHS period, so that's by um, the end of April, uh, and then we can sort of move on to the 21-22 uh, uh, audit later in the year. So what I was proposing to do was to um, hand over to Tharsha to talk you through the sort of the key issues uh, from our progress report uh, and then uh, to uh, allow opportunity for sort of questions after that, if that's OK. Thank you. OK, thank you then, Tharsha. Thanks, David. Um, so I'll take you through the report and then pull out some key areas which would be of interest. So if we can start at page 145 of the pack. Um, so here we've outlined our risk assessment. So all risks um, outlined here are those which we reported in our audit planning report. Um, we have not identified any new risks which need to be brought to your attention. <clears throat> so across these um, risks, we have made significant progress on the audit work that's required. However, the work does remain ongoing. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few points. So in respect to the risk around revenue recognition, we've identified one error at a value of 905k. This um, this regards this is with regards to an overstatement in the amount of grant revenue recognised. So that's based on the work completed by the council to date. 
And in respect of the risk around expenditure cutoff, we've identified one value, one error to the value of 2.96 million. And that relates to costs which haven't been recognised in the financial statements where goods and services have been received by the council prior to the year end. So details of both of these errors are on page 164, but I'll come on to that later in the report. Now, if we can move on to page 149. So this is the first slide which relates to our risk on valuation of non-current assets. So there's probably a couple of areas to highlight here. Um, the first being on page 150, which is around council dwellings. So for the year ended 31st of March 2021, a full revaluation of all beacons, so that's around 450, took place. So the key estimates which are used as the open market value of a beacon, and that's by reference to similar sales, sales in the property market. So to start with, we looked at a year on year movement in the beacons and then compare them to an average based on the reference to five different housing prices indices. So where these movements were out of range, and in this case, we identified around 300 out of range, we've undertaken more detailed work on the inputs into the values calculations. So what we've noted is that the values used three comparator sales to support the beacon revaluation. However, we noted that there weren't any adjustments made to the comparable properties sold for difference such as um, number of bedrooms, build types or locations. So in response to this, we asked the value to provide further comparables which were closer to the nature of the beacon property. Um, from a further review of these additional comparables provided, we are still identifying several differences for which we would expect a price adjustment to be made. Um, we're in the process at the moment of collating an overall analysis to show the level of differences we're finding across all of the properties. Um, so we're just in the process of engaging with the value and management just to identify the impact of these differences. So another area <clears throat> in respect to valuation of our current assets is around infrastructure assets. So just as an update from the last corporate committee, so SIPFA have now published Bulletin 12, which covers the issues to be considered regarding like a temporary solution for the accounting and reporting issues. So the temporary solution includes an update to the code, and that's um, through a statutory override, which will run from 2021 to 2025. And that basically gives a temporary relief not to report gross cost and accumulated depreciation. So uh, what we need from this is, I guess, um, a detailed review by the council um, to understand the pattern of consumption, consumption to ensure that appropriate useful lives are being assigned to the various parts of the infrastructure assets um, and to make sure that they're using a method that reflects the pattern where the assets future benefits or service potential are expected to be consumed. So I was going to move on next to page 159 which where we've got the slides on our use of resources review. So as part of our opinion, we have to provide on the financial statements audit, we are required to report any risks of significant weakness. So we've highlighted one risk in respect to financial sustainability. So this is around the fact that the council updated its medium term financial strategy covering the period 2021 to 2026 um, in February 21. So the council identified savings plans over the medium term, but there's currently around 15.6 million funding gap. Um, and that's cumulative to 2026. Um, obviously, we appreciate that the savings targets are quite significant and the achievement of these are inherently challenging. Therefore, we've raised this as a risk of significant weakness. So we move to page 162. Um, we've got a slide on just some other matters we would like to raise. Um, so with regards to the privileged user access to Northgate, um, we have now concluded on this issue and regard that the risk of the revenue account manager undertaking inappropriate transactions is, is low. The matter on the parking debtors is ongoing and we're just currently waiting for analysis from management to undertake further testing. Page 164. Um, this details the errors that we've identified to date. Um, so just to highlight that these adjustments are currently in discussion with management with regards to whether any amendments for these will be made in the financial statements. 
And um, currently from the work we've done to date, the cumulative impact is not material. Therefore, we wouldn't currently require these adjustments to be processed. Um, and therefore, we'll be, this will be left to management's discretion. I think that was everything I was going to pull out of the report. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, Councillor Amin. That was a very thorough um, uh, report presentation. It was very helpful, actually, can I say. Um, the one page I was slightly concerned about, and I don't know if I grasped the implications of everything, is a hundred page one five zero. You know the ones where you talked about the council dwellings, and the beacon properties. So, what was your final conclusion on that, please? We we are still um, still working with um, uh, officers to, uh, to to run that through. So, um, we we've analysed um, all of the sample that we're looking at. Uh, we were sort of helpfully sort of trying to colour code it so it's easy to follow, but basically identifying where we still have um, differences between the sort of the the, the um, characteristics of the sale property comparators and the beacon that we're trying to look at, um, so that the valuer and the uh, the council can sort of focus more closely on those. So, the, 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 I suppose the short answer at this stage is we are not finished yet. We haven't concluded yet. Um, but um, some extrapolation suggests it's more than a material figure, so we do need to do a bit more work to to get below that to make the um, the overall valuation position acceptable. Can I just ask? I mean, just to um, just so I got get it. Are you saying that you're looking at the value at which a property is sold and comparing it to the and how it stands against the Beacon property, which is the kind of comparable property? Is that what it, you what this yes, means? Yes, that, 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 that's sorry. right. <laughs> That's right. So the way the way the way, the way um, uh, HRA uh, properties are valued is that we select what's called a beacon. So uh, if you have a, a a bunch of flats in high rise, so say you've got a bunch of uh, two bedroom high rise flats, um, uh, what you would do is you would um, find a value for um, sales of similar sort of properties and uh, use that sale discounted for the fact that it's a social housing asset and multiply up by the number of um, uh, different flats that, that, that are within that beacon group. So say you've got sort of 3000 flats, which are two bedroom high rise, you would value one and then mathematically um, uh, calculate the total value. So if there's a small uh, error in one of them and say you've got 2000 of these these flats, then uh, that that multiplies up. So a thousand pounds error in the valuation against two thousand flats means a two million pound um, uh, potential error. So for all of these little differences, we have to be very really quite careful. Um, but yes, we do use um, recent or as recent as as available um, sales values for these types of properties. But the trouble is sometimes sales volumes are very small, which means that the value is required to take something that's close but not quite the same um, type as, as the beacon and make adjustments. So for example, uh, if we're valuing a two bedroom high rise flat as I mentioned earlier, but all we've got is a sale value for a three bedroom flat, then we need to make some adjustments because one would expect, and I'm sure this is sort of um, understood, one would expect that a three bedroom flat will be more expensive than a two bedroom one. So you would need to make an adjustment to adjust down to that. And what we're not seeing is those sort of adjustments um, being put through. So effectively, our beacon for a two bedroom flat is being valued at sale values for three bedroom flats. Thank you very much. Helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my question relates to the statement at the bottom of page 159. So I understand this report covered the the financial year that ended in March 2021. Um, and in the last paragraph of page 159, you say there's a significant risk that um, any non-realization of assumed government funding will have a negative impact on future projected targets in the N MTFS. Now, since, since March 2021, we had in December um, of 2022, an announcement of the provisional local government financial settlement for this year. 
as a result of that, does does this concern that non-realization of assumed government funding still hold, or was that does that provide us with enough reassurance that um, that that's uh, our assumptions were were broadly correct? Okay, I, I, I think when when we are um, reviewing this, the primary focus is on uh, on the arrangements that the council has in place to um, to forward plan and uh, for finances and and identify um, you know savings needs and and savings plans to 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 fill those gaps. Um, so yes, there is some degree of reality check in terms of what's happened afterwards. But what we're looking at is what are the uh, the arrangements in place to 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 gather that sort of data to make those sort of judgments to have the sort of processes in place uh, to make the, the the best estimate possible so obviously things don't necessarily pan out exactly as one would expect we're not um prescient about that so um but but the fundamental point is is we're looking at the arrangements in place for the budgeting so identifying that there are uh, gaps to fill doesn't necessarily mean that there is a significant weakness if the arrangements for forward planning on identifying those things and and putting in place saving schemes are, are sufficient to to cover off that risk. And ultimately, the, the reality check is that you're, you're still running. Satisfied with that question, I will come back. Uh, the runs answer rather. So if I understood correctly, you're you're stress testing the process, even though the feared outcome did not manifest itself. But in, in this kind of situation where local authorities have little visibility as to what government funding they are going to receive, what else can we do other than make these assumptions? So I, exactly. Exactly. Your, exactly. So yeah. it seems that there's not much more we could have done in the situation we found ourselves in. I, I, I think that's obviously we, we've got to go and do the, the, the detailed work on that on those uh, particular processes and uh, members may know that this is a it's a new approach to use of resources this year. So um, whereas previously if there was a significant gap uh, and we hadn't necessarily got sort of saving schemes to identify things that might have led to some sort of uh, qualification in the in the conclusion. Um, but now we are much more focused on that that sort of process for um, uh, for that sort of planning. So um, if you had, I suppose it's, it's a scenario just to sort of try and illustrate that. If you had um, uh, fortuitous sort of um, changes in sort of government grant funding, however, that your you had weaknesses in terms of making assumptions and forward planning or weaknesses in terms of schemes, even if you were still in a, in a reasonably safe position, we would potentially have to qualify or, or, or uh, raise a significant weakness if we thought that your uh, ability to manage that was more through luck than judgment. So it is, it is very much focused on those those um, uh, thought processes, the, the arrangements, the processes, the approvals, challenge and so forth, uh, rather than necessarily some of the, um, the changes in funding which come in later on. Great, thank you. So just, just to follow that up then, um, given the example and scenario that you, you, in, in view of that, um, what uh, obviously I'm sure you're discussing with officers. So what, what, what um, would you be expecting from officers um, to ensure that the significant risk that you've mentioned in terms of all the conversations that we've had so far will um, bring it down to either medium or, or low. Um, OK, so what what we will the process will go through uh, and, and financial sustainability uh, used to be one of the areas of significant um, risk under the old um, uh, NAO code of audit practice approach. So we already have a fair bit of um, information documented about how um, the arrangements work or have worked in practice, at least up until the 2019-20 financial year. So what we're looking to be doing in that respect is simply updating our understanding um, of uh, the arrangements since the last time we, we looked at that, uh, fill in any gaps which the new approach might require us to want to, want to look at. Um, and then sort of understand um, or, or, or see the documentary evidence trail 
of those assessments being made. So basically, we'll look through um, the, the supporting working papers, the very sort of um, uh, meetings that have been undertaken by officers in terms of preparation for um, uh, the, the financial plans and budgets, um, and the sort of papers that have gone through to members uh, to enable them to make sort of informed decisions as well. So that's that's what we're expecting to look at. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sure um, <laughs> officers will um, um, obviously provide you with whatever you need to um, do your work. Um, Councillor Culver, will you indicate it? Uh, on other matters of parking, have the LTNs have had any impact on the, on your decisions, etc. LTN, the local tra transport neighborhood, road traffic neighborhood. Thank you. I'm 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 not sure, I'm not Sorry, quite sure. I I, I I think this is this is solely to do with um, the information. Uh, which we have in respect of um, parking um, tickets, fines and things being being raised and the, the audit trail because there's a change of system and we can't get back to some of the detailed data. Oh, OK. Yeah, the, the, the data is actually pre preceding the, uh, the, the the introduction of the low traffic neighbourhoods and it actually relates to the parking accounts and the ability to just uh, clarify the change from the Civica system to the Toronto system and the ability to tap into those records, uh, which we are working with colleagues in finance and uh, the external auditors on. So when do you think then from, from a, a data um, cleansing and collection, but transfer or migration point of view. How, when will this be done? Because um, we've always had historically issues with with parking debt collection and the quality of the tickets that are being issued. You know, so um, so there's there's that aspect, and then there's the migration issue moving from one system to the other. Um, um, when do you think that that will be done or com completed? I think the question is perhaps directed to myself. Um, in in terms of time scale, in terms of resolution of the uh, item referred to in the report, um, that is being worked on at the moment, and, and as soon as possible would be my response. But I don't have a specific time scale for that. But what I could say is that what we are doing in, co in conjunction with colleagues in finance is ensuring that the Toronto Parking Management IT system actually generates all the reports that are required in the future to give the surety to finance and to uh, the auditors that there's a, a, a clear recognisable audit trail in place for every single pen of charge notice is issued. It's a case of how long is a piece of string? Um, um, and, and, uh, it, it is, it is. <laughs> yeah, the, the as soon as possible thing is like, uh, yeah. Uh, all right, because obviously it's of concern and 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 it's significant. So the the sooner we are able to shift this, um, the the better. So um, can I suggest that you come back once you've had conversations with your colleagues and uh, to give us a firm date uh, of when you are able or likely able to to resolve this? Because that as soon as possible answer is not acceptable. Understood, Councillor. I mean, I I get at least one email a week on this. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing issue which we are looking to resolve as soon as possible, as I said. Uh, it's, it is complicated by virtue of the fact that the Civica system, uh, we, we, we had difficulty accessing the old, those old records. Uh, if we had better access to that, then we, we might have been able to get, resolve this issue sooner. However, we're trying to find a, an alternative mechanism by which we can actually demonstrate the robustness of data for the past records. Thank you, Councillor Amin. But I was just going to ask, with this is just council um, debt, isn't it? Rather than who's um, the who's the company who runs um, parking controls in uh, homes? What used to be homes for having on our estates, basically, because I know that's also yeah. So, so presumably that's not in here either. I'm curious about that as well because I know lots of people. But that's a separate issue. I think this is this is the council's ab ability to collect the, issue, the tickets that's been issued and uh, and all the, the data to enable the um, external auditors, which they are, auditing our accounts to to um, provide them with that um, reassurance and um, 
assurance that <laughs> that uh, the the we we office our officers and the relevant cabinet member and the cabinet uh, doing the job that they're supposed to be doing in terms of all that. Any more questions or comments on that, Councillor? Yeah, a very pedantic point um, from page 170, and I think this is more for officers actually. Um, if you can answer it, um, but just the debug access. Um, I just wanted to know a bit more. Uh, I know it's probably uh, more of an IT focus. Um, but yeah, what the process is for them not to be, yeah, 35 um, inactive uh, yeah, accounts again. Like what is, because I know it says that you would um, have to request access by filling in a form, but do you request access and it stays with you? And then if you leave the company, it wouldn't, like it, it wouldn't get rid of it. Like how, how would it work basically? Like what is the process going forward? I just wanted a bit more clarity on that. Okay, yeah, All right. so I, I realised that, yeah, just um, if there is any clarity the, on that. The Sorry. external auditors are on the screen. Uh, I don't know, if, um, but the question you, you, you're you asking is obviously directed to an internal person, so like the yeah. audit uh, uh, IT person that's not here. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. maybe um, the clerk can uh, take that point away and um, give to the relevant officer to provide an answer to the question point that's been raised by Council Marvel. Okay. Um, great. In, I'd just like to thank um, the officers uh, from BDO uh, for, for their work and for highlighting uh, this. Um, I, I note that um, Casey is there. I don't know if he wants to say anything because we've been having some issues with uh, for pre previous meetings in getting reports and stuff because of the change, I think, uh, in uh, or changes in video. So, Casey, do you want to say anything to, or add anything to the report? Yeah, thank you so much, um, Councillor Ajay. Um, my name is Casey. I'm the Chief Accountant of the Borough. I think um, it's a well-worded report the auditors has brought to us, but I just want to point out that um, for us to understand that um, this is a progress report and um, the usual process for us to treat this is um, when auditors carry out the, uh, their audit and have observations. Usually we sit down with them to go through the observations and then agree on them, the ones that we need to adjust and the ones that we need to provide further evidence to satisfy them, we do. But at this stage, we haven't had that session. So um, we're going to have that session when they come close to the end of audit to go through all these items. So. It's just um, at this stage, just an observation. Some of them will clear out. Um, some of them will need to adjust for. So by the time you see the final audit comment, you might not see most of this thing. So it's still a work in progress at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can we um, note the um, report and thank um, um, officers from video for um, their time and for bringing this to our attention? Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move on to item 10, which is the Deputy Electoral Registration Offices, um, and it's pages 181 to 184. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll introduce this item. Uh, not that it's my report, but I'll introduce the item anyway on the basis of its linked to some extent to the report I gave earlier on. So if I could give some context in relation to the, um, the Electoral Administration Act of 2006 uh, gave electoral registration officers greater powers to hold hearings into existing entries on the electoral register, uh, as well as hearings into applications to go onto the register. So those hearings are actually quasi-judicial proceedings, and in some, case, in some cases need to be called and held in a matter of days. So the Electoral Commission guidance uh, is that the is that council should consider appointing a number of deputy electoral registration officers to ensure that those ERO functions uh, can be undertaken at all times because if it has to be done in a matter of days the person who is the electoral registration officer for council in, uh, for Harrogate in other words uh, the chief executive Andy Donald if he's not around and you've got to do this with a matter of days it then creates difficulties. Um, it's going to be further exacerbated by the, the subject we were talking about earlier on about the, the changes in the rules in terms of requirement for, for voters to provide photographic ID uh, when voting in person uh, at a polling station. 
uh, and that's being brought in, in 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 May of this year. So any citizen may apply for something called a voter authority certificate for free of charge, and they are aimed at anyone who does not have suitable ID. Um, but anyone may apply. Applications are made online at gov.uk and then then sent to the relevant local authority by uh, Her Majesty's government. So the electoral registration officers have a duty to provide emergency replacement voter authority certificates. Uh, these will not have the, the, um, the applicant's photograph on, but must by law be signed in ink and by hand by the electoral register, um, registra registration officer, a mouthful now, or an appointed deputy. Um, so it's therefore not reasonable to consider that the chief executive can do that at any time, given leave and everything else. So um, what this paper is really reflecting on is the, is the fact that the current head of service have checked the, the council's constitution as currently stands and democratic services have done likewise. Uh, and, as has, and found no delegation of, of deputy electoral registration officers. So in order to actually make sure that the, the council complies with the electoral commission guidance, we need to, de to actually designate some uh, deputy electoral registration officers. So the report identifies this and gives you the name of the head of electoral services, the deputy head of electoral services, which is currently vacant, but I think it's interviewing at the moment for that one, or on the verge of. Um, for the monitoring officer, head of legal and governance, uh, Fiona Alderman, and the chief people officer, Dan Paul, to be fulfilling those roles. Um, I would say that uh, all three of those individuals were heavily involved in the election in May 2022. Um, in actual fact, um, Fiona and Dan were, like myself, deputy returning officers on the day. So uh, it, it, it makes sense for those individuals to fulfill this role moving forward. Thank you, Chair. So basically, the report, um, the the acts or whatever it is, requires uh, each local authority to have named or prescribed deputies, and that's what the report is asking for. So, uh, any questions on that, or can committee uh, approve? Agreed. You you can still ask your question, okay. but it's. Approved. Are there any underlining difficulties with that? that uh, we should be aware of? The only underlying difficulty is if we needed to issue a voter authority certificate within a matter of days and Andy Donald was not available to do that because they would then be failing under the Electoral Administration Act of 2006. That would be the problem. So it's in our best interest to effectively have the 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 the, um, the DEROs in place. Then we've actually got our, our, a more robust position. The, the problem comes if we don't have those, rather than if we do. That's the only issue. Thank you very much for ensuring that we meet the requirements. Um, um, it's agreed. Um, we now move on to item eleven. Um, new items of urgent business. And no items have been received, Chair. Thank you. Item 12 is dates of future meetings. Dates are to be decided. This is the last one scheduled for the year. It's 28th of March. 28th of March is the last one. Thank you. Um, item 13 is exclusions of the press and the public. And I can see that uh, there's quite a lot of people out there not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, they, they've excluded themselves. Yes. Uh, I will read it. I was just, just put in that plug as it were. So um, we will now be considering item 14. Sorry, sorry, um, Chair. If I may. Go on. Um, I, I'm just mindful that the meeting is webcast. I don't know whether there's any members of the public watching online. And if there is, then maybe that webcast would need to be turned off. Yes, it does, but uh, we need to read. The... We need to read the um, section, the bit I was going to read out so that everyone is clear, whether you are online or uh, in person. So that's Absolutely. The OK. Right, thank you. I did say exclusion of the of the press and public, although there aren't any in person, there may be some um, watching online. 
So we will now be considering item 14, which contains exempt. Oh, sorry, sorry. Could you read, if you could read the paragraph? Yeah. Paragraph 14. Sorry, I forgot the paragraph. Yeah. Great. Okay, item 14 is to be subject of to a motion to exclude the press and public from the meeting as it contains exempt information as defined in section 100A of the Local Government Act 1972 as amended by this uh, section 12A of the Local Government Act 1985 at paragraph three. Thank you. I will now uh, stop the recording, thank you. Okay, can I ask um, can I ask those uh, in who are joined online to uh, leave the meeting, um, specifically those from BDN? So I just said BDN. Yes. Uh, we we are entitled to stay. Is that correct? Um. Can I just check? Sorry, um, David. You're suggesting you're in. Oh, has he got? You're suggesting you're entitled to stay. Yes. But this is for an exempt. The the reason that the me meeting members have resolved to go into private session is so to consider exempt minutes. Um, were you privy to those? To we're meeting? entitled to, to access to everything. Yes. Okay. That Minesh. Sorry, Benita. That, that's correct. What what David said is correct. Yeah, OK. Thank you. They are external legislators. They are auditing everything, including members' performance. Yeah, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> so it's scrutinizing whether we are doing our job properly as a corporate committee and all that. So if, if there are any concerns, areas of concerns, they can highlight it in their report. You know, so um, all that to ensure we're doing things properly. Anyway, moving on. Um, so we've excluded the price. We now have um, the um, um, minutes, exempt minutes um, before us at page 185. Um, can we agree those minutes? Are there any matters arising from members? No? They are agreed. OK. okay. Um, and we've talked about the dates of future meetings as above, which is the 28th of um, March next year, and the items will, the following items will be considered. <laughs> Sorry, next month. <laughs> next month. See, that's something they've picked up. Uh, <laughs> next month, and um, uh, Treasury management update for quarter three uh, will be on the agenda. Audit risk and risk quarter three progress report. Um, annual internal audit plan strategy and charter 2022 to 23 and uh, a verbal update on the 2021-22 audit progress. Um, and the meeting will commence at 7 p.m. At this stage, there are no planned training beforehand, but the chair may decide that he wants one. <laughs> so there you are. 
So can I thank you all for your time today and uh, have a safe journey. Thank, thank you. you and those online as well. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Yeah.